Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and we are here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. Our guests this week are the authors of the new book. It's called Money and Love, two important topics as we come into the new year. They are Myra Strober and Abby Davison, and we are going to be talking with them. So just a little bit of additional background for you. Myra is a labor economist at Stanford, as well as being the author of this book. Abby uh, spent years as a corporate executive. She was the head of the Gap Foundation. She founded the uh, Employee Resource Group for Parents at the Gap. And now they are sharing their accumulated wisdom here in Money and Love. Myra, Abby, great to have you both here. Thank you. Great it's to be here. Fabulous to be here. Thanks, Story. Awesome. And for those of you tuning in from around the world, we love having you here. And please take the opportunity, if you don't mind, type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you are dialing in from. We would love to hear from you. And also, of course, to take your questions for Abby and Myra. So the first question, Abby, I want to go to you. This is a moment where over the past year, we have been having a lot of conversations culturally about people leaving their jobs, the so-called great resignation. And as one of these decisions, I mean, basically your book, which I read and enjoyed, it is available, everyone, by the way, it comes out January 10th, so you can pre-order it now, um, but it's basically a guide to making life decisions. And so for someone who is in the position right now, uh, you know, they're, they're out on holiday break, let's say, and they're trying to figure out, oh my gosh, should I leave my job? Should I, you know, somehow reconfigure my professional life? How would you think about this? How would you advise someone who is perhaps watching this today and asking that question to, uh, to move forward with it? Well, Dory, we wrote this book because so often the conventional wisdom in the way that we're taught to think about these big decisions is so flawed. And so we're so often taught to think about career decisions with our heads and really analyze them and think about decisions about relationships with our hearts and maybe you know go with our gut and how we feel. And the truth is that all big life decisions, whether it's leaving your job, whether it's deciding the person to spend the rest of your life with, are really a combination of money and love and they need to be approached holistically. And if you just think about the financial aspects or the emotional relationship aspects, you're missing a huge part of the picture. And so I think it's great at this time when many of us are out of our daily routines, we maybe have some perspective that we might not ordinarily have to start thinking about what is most important to you. We have a, a five-step framework we talk about in the book, and I'm sure we'll get into it. And the first step is to really clarify what's important to you. And so if there's something about their, your job right now that's not hitting on one of those core values that you have, maybe this is a good moment to um, do some reflecting and we could talk more about what, how to think more about it. But the, the truth is to really think holistically about both the head and the heart and the money and love aspects of all of these big life decisions. Fantastic. Thank you. We are talking with the authors of the new book, Money and Love. That's Abby Davison and Myra Strobel. And we are talking about how to make changes and, and be thoughtful about what your life should look like in 2023. So please type your questions for them into the chat box. We want to say hi to our great friends tuning in from around the world. Carolyn's in North Carolina. Mary's joining from London. We have Diana in Portugal. Tina's in Chicago. Dean's in Houston. Stacy is in Newcastle. Neha's in Indiana. Diana is from South Carolina. Brinkley is from Qatar. Uh, Mihaela is from Spain. Anita's joining us from Chicago. And Iman is in Saudi Arabia. We love having every single one of you. Thanks for being here. Type your questions in. Now, Myra, this this book, as I understand it, emerged from a course that you've been teaching for many years at Stanford. You are the founding director of the Stanford Center for Research on Women. It's now called the Clayman Institute for Gender Research. So you have a great longitudinal history of tackling these questions, which um, don't necessarily get typically talked about or th even thought about necessarily in the context of a university class. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to create the course and what you have learned longitudinally about how people are approaching these life questions? Well, I started this course in the early 1970s and um, the course was called Women and Work. And uh, for many years, only women took the course and then uh, some intrepid men took the course and said, uh, you know, this course is for us too. 
we need to make all these decisions too. And one of them said, if you would change the name of the course, the title of the course to uh, work and family, um, I personally will recruit men for you for next year. And I changed the title and he recruited men. And then every year there were more men in the class. And the conversations got so much more interesting uh, from a personal perspective, from a work perspective. And so by the time I stopped teaching the course, 40% um, of the students were men. And we all realized that these are questions for everybody. Really, no matter your gender, no matter your sexual orientation, no matter your country, no matter your wealth or lack thereof, uh, you need to make decisions about uh, love and money. Yeah, absolutely. This is Dory Clark, and we're here with our weekly interview show for Newsweek Better. Our guests this week are Abby Davison and Myra Strober. And sorry, I said that wrong for Myra Strober. And she is the author of uh, Money and Love. They are here together. And we want to say hi. We have amazing people tuning in. We love having every single one of you here. Type your questions for Myra and Abby into the chat box. Chantel is in South Africa. Aziti is from Maputo, Mozambique. Alexander is in Johannesburg. Abimbola is in Na at Lagos. We have a LinkedIn friend from Florida. Uh, Sajan is from Austin. Carlos in Miami. Crystal's in the San Francisco Bay. And and Rebecca's in uh, Portland. Thanks for joining us. Now, Abby, a question that I think a lot of people are wondering about is when it comes to making these important life decisions, you know, we never know exactly how things are going to turn out. But as Charlie Munger likes to uh, point out, we can avoid a lot of problems just by avoiding being stupid. So what is the low hanging fruit so that we can at least not be stupid in making these choices? What are your thoughts? Uh, that is excellent advice. I, I think one of the biggest things is to not feel like you have to make a big life decision in an instant. Rarely do you have to make a decision overnight. And so one of the things that we've tried to do with our framework is to help people slow down because you're right. You don't know if a, a decision is going to be the right one, but you can feel more confident in your approach if you take a holistic, comprehensive approach that lets you avoid knee-jerk reactions that might be made based on emotion or frustration or something that will lead to regret in the future. And I have we've now road tested this framework over uh, the past, certainly years that Myra has been teaching the course, the past several years as we've been working on this book, I've made several very big life decisions personally using the framework. And I can say that it really works. And these have not been smooth road story. As you know, the past few years have had plenty of potholes and mudslides and avalanches along the way. And so um, we really believe that this is a, a sturdy but flexible framework that can be applied to all sorts of big life decisions. Fantastic. We definitely need that. The new book is called Money and Love. You can learn more about it at moneylovebook.com. It is coming out imminently. It is going to be re released January 10th, so you can pre-order it today so that you can uh, ensure you have a better new year. And if you are enjoying this session, hit the like button and hit the share button so that your friends and colleagues can benefit from it and see it on social media as well. So Myra, one of the, uh, one of the key elements of the new book of of money and love is that you guys have a framework that you share for problem solving and thinking through some of these life questions. You call it the five C's. Would you mind giving us a brief overview of what that looks like and how we can actually thoughtfully apply that in the situations that we may be facing? The first C is the one that Abby mentioned a minute ago, clarify, figure out what it is you really want, what you really want not what your Aunt Bessie told you to want when you were four years old and not what somebody else wants in your family today, what you really want. And that's not easy, but that's step one. Step two is communicate. Communicate what you want to the other relevant people in your life. And you mentioned before, what is the stupidest uh, thing you can possibly do? That probably comes under the communication rubric because... Um, you know, trying to tell your spouse or your boss or anybody else uh, what you want kind of on the fly 
Now your husband's walking out the door or your spouse or your significant other. Um, and you suddenly say, um, I, I have something I really need to tell you. So that's not a good plan. Uh, so we are very specific in the book about how to communicate. And Abby, you want to talk about the other uh, pieces of this? Sure. So the third step is about choices. So often we are um, get very binary and tunnel vision when we have a big decision to make. Do I marry this person or break up with them? Do I take the job or um, leave town? Um, and, and the truth is that there are many shades in between two extremes, but we get so focused on what the extremes are that we sometimes forget to think about all the different choices we have in the middle. So this step is really about thinking um, through all of them and maybe putting some more back on the table that you might have inadvertently left out. Ones that might actually let you have your cake and eat it too, which is the, the best, right, of all worlds. Um, the fourth step is check in. So there are, again, this is a, a step to help people get perspective to help people step outside themselves and talk to co trusted colleagues, even trusted resources like published studies. Um, Myra shared a lot in the course that you mentioned of, of the research that actually helped to change some people's minds about decisions they were might have made differently if, if not for seeing uh, those, those resources and that, that evidence. And then the last step is consequences really thinking through the short, medium, and long-term consequences of different potential decisions so that you can, again, be prepared for, I mean, listen, this is not um, a silver bullet or a, a magic wand that lets you make every decision perfectly, but when you go through these steps, you can more better anticipate the consequences and then be prepared for when those inevitable monkey wrenches do come in. Excellent. Thank you very much. The new book is Money and Love. I'm Dory Clark. We're, this is our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. If you want to make sure you never miss an edition of it, you can go to my website. It's doryclark.com. You can sign up, download a free self-assessment. You will join the email list and you'll get reminders about conversations like this. And if you want to learn more about the book by our friends who are joining us here, Abby Davison and Myra Strober, you can go to moneylovebook.com. Now, some great questions are coming in from our from our viewers here and i love this one myra if you could tackle it we would appreciate it brian wants to know how do you decide between normal boredom and yearning for personal growth in a position it, what, what what's an acceptable amount of uh, feeling a little dissatisfied and what is the trigger to figure out okay i really need to move i really need to do something different what would you say well, of course, the toughest time to make this decision is when you're just starting out and you don't have other jobs that you've had in the past to compare it with. Um, uh, but, you know, the best thing to do, if it's possible, is to compare the current job with one you've had in the past. And know, remember, the excitement that you may have had before, uh, the lack of excitement you may have had before. So the more choices you give yourself in your head, uh, the better off you are. But in terms of our framework, it's really helpful on this question to check in with other people, not necessarily other people who are working at the same uh, location, um, but other people in your network. Explain, but people who know you, people who know what you're capable of, uh, of what your values are and, uh, talk with them about this and see if you and they together can generate some uh, other options. Uh, do you need to quit? Is it possible that you can change the job you're currently in to give you more satisfaction? Um, so you, you want to be sure to check in and increase the number of choices that you have before you make a decision. Really great point. The book, the new book uh, by Abby and Myra, who are joining us here today, is Money and Love. We want to say hi to some of our great friends tuning in from around the world. Juan Esteban is here from Costa Rica. Khaled's in Tunisia. Harry's saying hi from Sweden. Amanda's in Boston. Annette's in SoCal. Adnan's in Turkey. Vanessa's in Haiti. Zeke is in San Benito, Texas. And Francis is in Bogota. We love having all of you, and we're taking your questions for Abby Davison and Myra Strober, the authors of the new book, Money and Love. 
love. Now, Abby, a question for you came in from Dean. And Dean wants to know, in your experience, what are some common challenges that people face when it comes to navigating the balance between love and money in their own relationships? Would you mind commenting on that? Well, it's a terrific question. And one of the amazing gifts that I've been given is that I took Myra's class with the man I'd been dating for about a year who, spoiler alert, is now my husband. And so we had the benefit of having all of this information, the wisdom that Myra shared and so many guest speakers shared um, through the course. And I can say that it's so helpful. And I would say if you do pick up a copy of the book, which we'd love uh, for you to do, to share it with the person you are in a relationship with so that you can talk about it together. We have um, a lot of helpful exercises that we've put into the book that are very similar in some cases to the ones that Myra had in her class that I got to do with my partner at the time that has really served us well over the course of our relationship. We have two young kids, we've changed jobs multiple times, we've cared for ailing relatives. And I will say the biggest C that is of our framework that's important in finding that balance is the communicate uh, step. Because it's so um, often that when you're in a relationship with someone, you, you know them, you just assume that you know what you want, they want, and you assume things go without saying. And the truth is that things never go without saying. It's never a bad idea to share how you're feeling with someone. If you feel like things are out of balance in terms of the money love equation, if, if you're spending too much time focused on your careers at the expense of time um, being close with one another or seeing family and friends that you value, articulate that and have a conversation. Not as Myra mentioned, as you're running out the door to do something or you're trying to you know, get the kids off to school, but maybe outside on a hike, out of your day-to-day -day routine, where you can bring up a conversation that feels um, less charged and introduce a topic of, of balance and say just, hey, I was listening to these authors talk on Dory's show the other day. And I'm curious, how do you feel the balance of money and love in our relationship is going? And just try to tease out some of the, um, the thoughts that they might be having and not sharing and go from there. Fantastic. Abby Davison, Myra Strober, they're the authors of the new book, Money and Love. You can get it at moneylovebook.com. Myra, in your book, you talk about, you, you know, both of you share personal stories and, and relationships and things like that. You have now, Myra, been married for a long time. An important question. If you are dating, I mean, you know, it's it's LinkedIn. People be like, it's, it's not Instagram, people. It's LinkedIn. You know what? Everyone wants to know everywhere. So I'm going to ask you, if you're dating someone, how do you know when they're the one? How do we decide, Myra? We know that getting married to someone is the most important decision we make in our lives, unlike a job, which you can quit. Uh, I mean, I guess you can quit a relationship, but it's it's harder. So what, what should we be looking for? How do we know when it is the right time to actually decide to marry someone? What do you think? Well, of course, this is indeed one of the most complicated questions ever. And um, <laughs> um, I can't give you the answer in two minutes or less. Uh, but I can say that the definition I have of intimacy, which is, I think, what people want in a love relationship, is into me see. So the first step again is um, figuring out what it is about you that you want to communicate <laughs> and then communicating it. And if you're trying to judge whether this person is the right one for you to spend the rest of your life with, ask yourself, do I feel comfortable telling this person everything about me on an ongoing basis, because everything about me changes as we go forward. Um, do I feel that this person gets me, understands who I am? And do we have a relationship that we're creating where both of us are doing this? Both of us are letting the other person see who we really are and does this person want me to be my best self always? And I think if the answers are yes to that, those questions, you can go on and ask some other questions. But I think those are the two basic questions. 
Those are great. Thank you very much. This is Dory Clark with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. We want to say hi to our amazing friends tuning in from around the world. Miriam is in Mexico. Carlos is back from Colombia. Ishrat's in Chicagoland. Minerva's in Mexico City. Vasilios is tuning in from Greece. Smriti is from London. Eric is in Salt Lake City. We've got Raquel from Italy. Miguel from Chile. Modesta's joining us. We have She's from Northern Ireland. And Abu Bakar is in Guinea. And Dia is from France. We love having every Every single one of you joining. Thanks for being here. And we have some amazing questions coming in. Um, Abby, we're wondering, Rebecca wants to know, could you actually walk us through how to use the 5C framework around decision making? And you guys in your book talk about a lot of a lot of different use cases. You've got, you know, should you take the job? Should you marry the person? Um, maybe just for, for sake of argument, one of the things you talk about is where should we live? This is particularly uh, tricky sometimes. Maybe one spouse has a career option somewhere and the other person maybe isn't so keen on it. That can be complicated. Um, could you take that example or if you prefer a different one and briefly walk through how you could apply the five C's to, to begin to figure out the answer to this question? Absolutely. And, and this... The beauty of this framework, as I mentioned, is that we've been road testing it in real time. So this is a very um, real decision that actually Myra and I both made over the past several years. Interestingly, we used the same framework. We came to completely different conclusions and had different decisions. So I'll share my personal example of um, as we were writing this book, it was during the height of the pandemic, my two young kids who were in kindergarten and second grade at the time were zooming in to school from our dining room. Uh, my husband and I were working from home as well, having suddenly pivoted our jobs to ones that we did in our in our house. Uh, and there we had several college students coming in and helping our kids do their schooling. And it was a really full house. We had not ever thought we would have this many people full time having a, a school, an office, a gym, a restaurant, all the things in our house. And so we needed more space. And so that was when we used the first C of clarify. We said it's important to us to find more space and to find um, a, a place that had schools that were likely to be in person. We were in San Francisco, the largest urban school district in the country that was on Zoom school for the longest. And so we felt like those were the things that were important to us. So then we communicated. We talked to each other. We talked to family and friends to try to find a potential suburb that we might move that would give us more space, that would give us schools that would be open. And those um, friends uh, introduced us to realtors. And those realtors helped us look at lots of different choices. We looked at houses that were big, uh, bigger than ours, but not in walking distance to places we looked at. We thought maybe we could um, rent a house for a little while and get to know a new city instead of moving. So that was on the table at, at, a, at another point. Um, we did a lot of checking in, both with people who had made the move from the city to the suburbs, as well as people who had looked at that as an option and decided not to. Um, and, and we checked in with relatives. My father was in um, the suburb, near the suburb we were looking at. And we said, are you planning to stay? Are you thinking you might ever move if we move closer to you? Um, so we had lots of conversations. Interestingly, through those check-ins, um, we actually re-clarified what was important to us because when we thought about the consequences of buying a bigger house in a suburb, that would have been very expensive. We've been in our current home for over 11 years. Um, we know what our mortgage is and we know that we can afford it. And so when my husband and I thought about, okay, well, we could make this move, but we would then be tied to our jobs in a bigger way than we would have ever been before because we'd need to pay this bigger mortgage and we'd we'd sort of be on this treadmill. And what we what was important to us changed. It actually became less about more space and more about having career flexibility. I was working on this book. I knew that someday I might want to focus on it more full time. He was thinking about starting his own business. And so we said, you know what? Actually, what's most important to us is career flexibility. At that point, it was likely that the schools were going to be open. And so we said, OK, let's stop this. We're going to stay. And even though it looked on the surface like nothing had changed because we were still in the same place, um, it, it was actually everything was different. It was night and day. We no longer felt so um, compressed and confined by our space. We felt 
free because we had made the choice uh, proactively to stay having worked through this whole framework. And we are we have changed some other things in our lives, um, but we're still in the same place. And um, we are very happy to have made the decision the way we did. Uh, that's great. Thank you for walking us through that. That's Abby Davison. She's here with Myra Strober. They're the authors of the new book, Money and Love. And Myra, a question came in. We'd love to hear your perspective on this. The, uh, the LinkedIn user wants to know, how do you dedicate significant time and resources to your own developmental goals without feeling selfish? Uh, is there specific language that maybe you could suggest to explain to loved ones why you need to do this? How do you think about this and, and balance that out? This is such a wonderful and important question. Um, yes, I think that the how you communicate this to the other people in your life is is simultaneously difficult and probably one of the most important things you can do. Um, again, you want to create the right setting for this. So you want to get out of your living room, certainly out of your kitchen, uh, leave all the unwashed dishes, uh, go take a walk. Um, hopefully it's a nice day and you can have a nice walk. Uh, you know, leave the children, uh, if there are children with uh, some babysitter or a grandparent or somebody and, and just take a walk and listen to one another. Um, this starts out with your wanting to communicate something to your partner or your loved one. But no doubt that will bring up something for your partner that they want to communicate. So you've got to be prepared for active listening. People think that communication is about talking. And of course it is about talking, but it's also about listening. And active listening is so important. When you say active listening, it means that the person that you're listening to realizes and understands deeply that you are listening and getting that person. So often you want to mirror back what that person is saying. I hear you saying that you need some more time for your own development also. That kind of active listening goes a long way. And if you are not used to communicating, this is a great topic to start with. <laughs> it's a new year and you can begin this process at any time. Just signal to the person you're communicating with that you wanna try something new so that they're not totally surprised. But this is, again, it's hard to do, but if both of you are in sync about doing it, you'll get there for sure. Fantastic. We're, we're going speed round. So we're going to have one more question for each of you. We'll go to Abby and then Myra will wrap up. But this is Dory Clark. Our show is Better, the Newsweek interview show. You can learn more about their book, the, which is called Money and Love at moneylovebook.com. Now, Abby, the question for you comes in from Sarah. She wants to know, do you have advice about love and careers in two different states? These days, people are, are so mobile. We're so global. There's plenty of long distance relationships. Um, what should we be thinking about when it comes to making smart decisions about that? Do you have any advice to share with Sarah? Absolutely. And I would say it starts with knowing what's important to you. Uh, so without knowing any more information, are do those states have um, different impacts on uh, if you're near loved ones? So, much, so many of the moves that we made over the past several years were to be closer to the people who we wanted to be able to see in person. And so um, that could be a factor. So clarifying what's important to you. Different states also have different laws regarding family leave, regarding um, lots of things. And so making sure you're doing the research, checking in with the resources to understand the impacts of living in different states. I don't know if uh, it's a situation where two partners are in two different states. We talk a lot about this in the book. Um, it's really important to think about the long-term consequences of maintaining two careers in two different states if you're in a long-term relationship. So that certainly is a topic to communicate about and think about if the goal is to get to one state, what are the choices that could help you get there in the long run. 
Really thoughtful advice. Thank you very much. That's Abby Davison. We're going to turn for our last question to Myra Strober. Myra, what I'm curious about, as we're making these important life decisions that people grapple with, inevitably, there are going to be roadblocks. So what is your best advice about how to tell when something is just just a roadblock, just a sort of temporary setback. Oh, it didn't work out quite the way you imagined, but let's pivot around it as compared to, whoa, this is not working at all. We need to completely reconfigure the plan. Many people get flummoxed because they can't tell the difference. What advice would you give? Well, I would say begin by assuming that it's a roadblock <laughs> and um, you know, try to work around the roadblock. And if that's not successful, then, you know, come together again, take another walk, um, <laughs> uh, go out for dinner together, whatever works for you, and think about um, the possibility that this may really be a permanent barrier of some sort, and then begin to uh, think together about how you're going to get around this barrier. I mean, in a certain sense, a roadblock and a permanent barrier are similar. In both cases, you have to get around it. <laughs> so um, strategizing how to do that is uh, critical. Fantastic. Very wise words of advice. The book comes out January 10th. You can pre-order it now. It's called Money and Love. It's by Myra Strober and Abby Davison. Abby, Myra, so great to have you here today. Thank you. It's been fun. This has been great. Thanks, Dory. Thank you both. Thanks to everyone tuning in. If you've enjoyed the conversation, hit the like and share button so that your friends and colleagues can benefit from it on social media. And we will see you next week.